Do we have a relativistic version of angular momentum? Mm, that's an interesting question. So you have, well, let's just write that down as an example. So you know about angular momentum. Someone other than Gauge, tell me what, um, ang so angular momentum which we use letter L to you know, stand for. Um, someone other than Gauge, tell me some other things that angular momentum is related to. Radius, okay. So angular momentum is momentum of something spinning, right? So it will be related to so angular velocity. Okay, so if you're going that way, we can actually do an analogy to this. We can say angular momentum is the rotational inertia times angular velocity as some kind of vector quantity, all right? So that probably, my first guess would be, okay, that probably won't be relativistically correct. Because here's the thing, um, when you're looking at omega, just like there's a limit, uh, oh, oh, this is a good point to discuss speed limit. So, um, yeah, so thank, uh, sorry. Good, it's good that this point got brought up. So, I mentioned earlier, when you look at the expression gamma, it becomes problematic if a beta is greater than one, right? So, because if then gamma becomes imaginary. Now, um, if you are in theoretical physics, you will hear physicists talk about like tachyonic particles or tachyonic something. There is some hypothesized stuff that's supposed to be moving faster than the speed of light. Um, but when, so this is the problem you would run into if you are imagining something like a regular object going from zero speed to something that's greater than speed of light. Imagine how its energy changes. So gamma starts out at one. So kinetic energy starts out at zero, or if you are looking at total energy, total energy starts out at mc squared. As beta becomes closer to one, as it increases, what happens to, the, what happens to gamma? Increases, right? And as beta approaches one, gamma approaches infinity. What that means is for beta to become exactly one, it'll take infinite amount of energy. So you know, maybe it's possible, maybe it's impossible to put this on the other side of the speed barrier. But if you want to push it through the normal way, it'll take a literally infinite amount of energy. So. Um, so that's uh, the best justification I can say for why speed of light is the universal speed limit. Um, it takes an infinite amount of energy to get to, not exceed, but just to get to the speed of light. Yes? Would time start going backwards? Would yeah, that's uh, something that, yeah. So that's the theoretical physics that I don't want to address because I'm not qualified. <laughs> you can read about it on your own. It's not what we cover in lower division physics. Um, they are all speculative. They may be correct. That's just one of the features of the tachyonic terms, but it comes down to their speculations. <laughs> there are no experimental support. So uh, based on that, V has a speed limit. So if you are saying momentum was just MV, you would have a hard limit for momentum. Fortunately, momentum is gamma MV. So momentum can actually increase without limit. And we probably want to say something similar for angular momentum. And if we want to say angular momentum is just this, omega will probably have a speed limit that's based on the speed limit of light and just the size of the object. So, so this is the non-relativistic expression that's probably not going to be correct relativistically. So I want to go through this exercise of trying to guess at what would be the relativistically correct expression. And I will tell you that this is not the only expression involving angular momentum. There's at least two more. I know in physics 4A, when I get to rotation, I tell you, it becomes even more important for you to know these things thoroughly, because often knowing one relationship won't be enough. You have to know all of the relationships that involve this quantity, of which there are two more. Yeah, that's actually the fundamental definition of angular momentum. R cross P. And because this, people here remember cross product, kinda? You have a sense it's different from that product, and it gives you a vector back. 
Um, so the order matters here. This is actually the definition of orbital angular momentum. And momentum, we can write it relativistically correctly. And R, um, as long as I'm staying in one reference frame, I can probably just keep this as it is. So if we are trying to guess at an expression that's relativistically correct, this is the best bet. Because one, this is already corrected for, and this uh, probably. <laughs> but uh, so in this class, we won't deal with anything that's uh, rotating with a relativistic uh, angular momentum, <laughs> precisely to avoid this. Um, oh, and the last expression is how this is related to torque. So torque is rate of change of angular momentum. So if you're trying to deal with torque in a relativistic situation, um, it should be based on this somehow. So there's quite a lot of physics and mechanics that we won't get to because we don't have the mathematical tools, we don't have the time. So, um, so even though this class supposedly has a prerequisite of math 3C, you will actually see that we don't really use multivariable calculus. You use them more in physics for me than ever in this class. Just the way it works out. <laughs> so, um, so, but I just want to leave you with that there, more for your upper division work than work for this class. That, um, that this uh, things about special relativity that we are introducing, it's a paradigm changing. That we've uh, done a little bit of correction with the energy and momentum. But what you have to remember is that any other piece of physics you learned before special relativity, when you come across it again, you should, you, when you come across it again, and you are dealing with a situation where, uh, uh, where gamma is much greater than one, or you're dealing with a situation where things are moving close to the speed of light, then you have to ask the question, well, what is the relativistic version of that? Uh, 